So um, five, it's been five years since I um, started working with transition towns. And I did that because of what I noticed um, around me was a, an incredible need to respond from grassroots to the challenges of the day. And, and what I mean by that is particularly the challenges of peak oil and climate change that we are at this point where we're now peaking in our energy consumption um, and it's probably downhill from here and that's not a terrible thing, it's probably a really good thing especially from climate change because the less we put out, the, the, you know, we start to have less effects from all of that carbon that's going into the atmosphere. Yeah? So I had a couple of years of volunteering for Transition Towns um, and it was somewhere in there that I met Pete, um, who had just arrived from Australia. And we started some conversations around, uh, around food distribution, and he'll tell you his story on it, but it was a really lovely, um, a, a lovely collaboration. It was a real pleasure and an honor to be working with Pete and to see how a seasoned entrepreneur takes on a, a project like this. And, and I've never seen anybody as tenacious as Pete is. Um, hitting, hitting wall after wall and constantly finding ways over and around and under and through these things to, to, to get Ruby to what it is today. So that, that was an incredible pleasure. And I don't take um, any great credit except for being there at the beginning. And, and you know, he's driven it. Um, the food forest um, activity that I've been involved in now for, since the beginning of the year um, has been a, a very rapid journey. It's quite extraordinary. I'll just jump in and show you kind of what's, what's been happening. But first I want to talk, give you a little bit of, of, of history, just to put it all into context. Right? Around about um, uh, 60,000 years ago, um, the Fertile Crescent, right, which is that, that incredible green lush area in the Middle East. Yeah, you all know that green lush area in the Middle East? You think Middle East green lush? No, you think desert, right? Well, it didn't used to be. It used to be green and lush. But many, many years of agriculture um, depleted the soil and has turned that into a desert. And that's effectively what we're doing with most of the world in terms of industrial agriculture. This is not an ecosystem, right? This, this is a man-made environment. Um, and it's on the way to becoming a desert, to put it really simply. You cannot do this ad infinitum. It's, it is not sustainable, which means that it will come to an end. Growing food like this is, will turn your land into a desert. Yeah. It did some interesting things along the way. Um, when we started to grow, grow food like that, we started to grow a great abundance of it, and we, we started to create a surplus. And the interesting thing about this, creating a surplus is that it's actually changed our society and made our society much more complex. We, we, we needed technology to store this. We needed police to protect it. So people didn't just run off with the grain. Yeah. A lord, root of the word lord means keeper of the bread. We needed a lord to parcel it out. We needed counters to measure it, laws to regulate its distribution and punishment for people who didn't obey the laws. And all of this has come out of this open field agriculture where you chop down trees and, and, and make big plantations, of particularly grain. Interestingly, although it seems, and, and it's been in our consciousness all of our lives, we've had this kind of industrial agriculture, um, and whatever was in existence when we were born, we tend to think is normal, all right? We think that sort of agriculture is the only way to feed the world, but what we actually discovered, if you look back in history, and you look, 15th century there were seven famines, and in the 16th there were 13, and the following there were 11, and then in the 18th century, 16 famines. That's an average of one every 12 years. This large scale monocultural type agriculture is very, very vulnerable. It's it, it, vulnerable to failure. Yeah. Um, this is basically what we've done. We've taken an industrial approach to growing food, yeah. and it's very, very energy intensive. We've gone to war with, our, with our, our, our ecosystems, you know, spraying chemicals and so on and so forth. You know, I, mean, I don't need to go into the details of that. Most of you are well aware of the consequences. And we've created a centralized system. Yeah? All the food comes in and it goes into this big box store. And interestingly, if you don't have a piece of plastic or a bit of some coins in your pocket, you know, or bits of paper, you don't get in there to get the food out. Okay? So 
this is one of the things that's, that's motivating me. It's, it's how do we get the food out of there and into our local communities in a way that makes it really accessible? Um, just to put the, the energy picture into context, we're kind of right at the center of that right now. It's a little blip, a little blip of history. Um, and, and it's, at the moment, I think we're, we're talking about using 10 calories of fossil fuel to produce a single calorie of food. It's not sustainable. This was the thing that really tipped it over the edge for me. Um, I moved into a new house in April last year. I put in hundreds of hours in my garden to put in a really nice, productive vegetable garden. November, it was looking fantastic. And by January, it was looking really sad because I live on Waiheke and I don't have unlimited water. Okay. These three maps show you historical average of the water deficit in that soil at the 11th of March. The middle one was last year, and the one on the right was this year. Yeah, and that was, that was the 11th of March, and the drought went on for another month beyond that. Right? So that was the point where I said, hmm, open field growing of food doesn't, it's, it doesn't work. It's not sustainable in the long term. Yeah? And, and I come across well, and, and this is what happens when you do this open field stuff, your soil blows away or it washes away in the next flood. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's, very, it's a very simple kind of logic, it's easy enough to understand. So, so what are the alternatives? What if we could redesign this and that into multi-layered systems of mostly perennial plants? When the drought hit you know, this, this year, um, I looked around and I noticed that the bush around us was still doing okay. Right? In fact, you could walk into the bush and it was still quite nice and cool. You know? It had a nice little bit of moisture in the air and, and you know, the temperature was a lot lower. Um, if you were to dig in under the ground, you'd find the water was there, not very deep, you know? and the plants were doing okay. We weren't out there watering the forests and the bush. You know? it was, it's looking after itself because it's an ecosystem. It's, it's, a, it, it's a, a system which traps the water and holds the water and keeps the plants in that system thriving. Yeah. So what if you could take a forest system and, it, and, and then replace every element in it, and I'm not saying replace the forest with something else, I'm saying create forests where every element in that forest is actually food. So from under the ground to ground cover, you know, you start thinking about your, your, your green vegetables and, and you know, salad and stuff, um, your herbs, right up to your, your um, artichokes and so forth, you know, big herbs, your shrubs and bushes, the berries, all those things, then your trees, what we think of normally as our orchard trees, then the canopy trees, right? so nut, big nut trees, you know, pecans and chestnuts and walnuts and things. And then some vines growing up through all of that. You then have a forest system which can sustain itself over a long period of time ad infinitum. You know, within <laughs> as good as as good as we need to think about it. Um, that is producing an enormous amount of food. Okay, that grain field that you saw earlier, that's producing in the US that will produce about 1.2 kilos per square meter of grain. One per about 1.2 kilos per year. No. Yeah. 1.2 tons. 1.2 kilos per square meter. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So if you if you take a, uh, a rice field, you're talking about 1.7 kilograms per square meter. In a mature forest system like this, you can expect to get around five kilos of, of produce per square meter. It's a very, very big difference because you're harvesting so much more photosynthesis. Yeah. When you look at, look at something like that, you think, oh, what's in there? Okay. Um, you know, it's all very nice. This is a, a, a little forest garden in New Plymouth that I came across when I was giving some talks earlier this year. Um, but there you go, there's what's in it. There's some figs over here on the left, some strawberries down there, ground level along with some pepinos. Some Pumpkins over there in the back, a nice big tamarillo, some runner beans going up that tree, and there's probably a few other things besides. Yeah. Good 
goodness gracious, I haven't seen you in a very long time. <laughs> so I came across this manual um, through my work that I do with uh, Tiger Polytechnic, particularly the Center for Sustainable Practice in Monaco. One of my students last year who I teach social media to was this fellow Andy Cambius, who his major project for the year was to create a food forest in Harley Flat. And they got a 49 year lease with the local council, um, and they established the first 700 square meters, um, expandable out into tens of hectares. And he didn't just do the project, he actually wrote the manual for how to do the project on public land, community food forests on public land. Yeah. So I read it and went, oh well, that's a no brainer. You know, that's like paint by numbers because he laid it out so beautifully and it was it was impeccable logic. And, and so got together with a few friends on Waiheke and said, come on, let's do it. And so they all agreed and, and away we went. Um, at the same time that I was um, just getting ready to talk to the council after we got quite a lot of community support, substantial community support, done a crowdfunding um, thing to get Andy up to Waiheke with, and full house of the cinema and so forth, I started seeing articles like this. It's uh, Christ, Christchurch District Health Board looking for food, land for food forests in Christchurch. A, uh, a group going to the Waitemata local board saying, we want to put a food forest in the Auckland domain. Do you realize Auckland domain is about 100 acres? Yes. Massive amount yeah. there. Put you know, a nice little three acre food forest in there would be superb for 10. Um, then we started working on the, the Waiheke food forest. And this is a fairly recent picture. We, we'd actually planted these trees some five years ago. And now we're going, to, we're going back into that, that same plot. And we're starting to, to build the understory, right? Those other levels that aren't there, because it was basically just always only originally thought of as an orchard, but now we're transitioning it to a food forest. Where is that? Um, it's behind the old Surfdale Post Office. Um, around this time I, I got a, um, I decided that it was a really good idea to get the web domain foodforest.co.nz, which I got, and about two weeks later I got a call from a, um, a farmer from Fielding who said, oh, I want to put in a 10-acre food forest on busy road frontage and, and use that as a model for having food forests on road frontages all through the country. And I said, great, <laughs> let's talk. I'm not giving it the main, but let's talk. And, and so I've been down and visited him, and we went to the fielding um, local hall, and we had 60 people come out, including the mayor, um, to talk about food forests. Yeah. So the, the interest is starting to grow quite substantially. Um, I just found out about this one acre food forest in Waihee recently. They planted it up in one day. It's part of an education um, institute down there. Uh, and that's expanding. They're, they're talking about you know, expanding that considerably. And then I, um, then I heard about this one, <laughs> which really, really got me going. Um, this is 20 hectares. That's 50 hectares. Right? And this is a substantial example of what can be done at a commercial scale, growing food in a, in, a, in a system that mimics a forest and produces enormous amounts of food using perennial plants, minimal fossil fuel energy, um, and, and tremendous outputs. There's, a, there's an intention of the owner of this property to feed a community of 300 people. Yeah. So I thought we'd better have a, um, a hui and call in people from around the country, and so um, just about three weeks ago or so, we had a three-day hui over in Northcote. It was oversubscribed. We, the, the room that we rented was good for 50 people, and we had uh, about 56 people register. So I had to turn the six away because I knew that on the second day we'd also invited 10 people from the council um, who came along to talk and, and share some ideas with us and us with them. Um, so incredibly successful event, um, tremendous feedback from the council, tremendous feedback from the people that attended and, and the, uh, the designer who was doing that 50 acre one in the Rapper was there and he just blew everybody away with these plans to show, look, this is something which you can do at a very large scale. This is not just backyard, although it can be backyard. Um, and then at that event we um, launched a, a new qualification. 
So we have an NZQA approved level 5 certificate qualification in food forest design, which is starting in February next year. We've already got 25 people that have, that have registered their interest in it, and we only need six to start it. So I think that'll go this year quite well. We'll do probably one in the North Island and one in the South Island in the second half of the year. Um, that feels so darn good to have that, I can tell you, because this is, you know, by the end of this year, you, I, I guarantee there will be another 20 people out there who will know how to initiate, design, and implement, and project manage food forest projects. Yeah, so that's, that's our goal, is to make up a, a farmer brigade of, of people who understand how to grow local food in ways that are sustainable. So there you go, that's, um, that's it from me. And, um, and I'm going to hand over to Pete and then the two of us can, can engage with you in some conversation. Cool. Yeah, so I, I don't have any slides, but I think that what uh, James I'm still going to actually get my back there because I'm going to be ready for the stool. Is there an easy way to turn this one? So yeah. Yeah, sure. <coughs> so well, thank you very much Barry and Susie and everyone here at Ospan for inviting us along. It's really exciting. I feel like we're in a, a time where there, there's a lot of traction happening and we've got that there's history happening and it's happened over the last five years in particular and they're showing that there is a real movement um, and there are real results leading in the direction of a more sustainable way of, of you know doing food uh, <clears throat> my background has been for the last well, coming up to 11 years now has been in the food industry and i've uh, run and start and run uh, food businesses all the way from manufacturing uh, through to distribution and wholesale and even retail. Um, and I've had an opportunity to work on a domestic level as well as importing and you know on the, the global food scene. And uh, yeah, five years ago there was a, a kind of a, an interesting episode that occurred and I moved over from Sydney having made some good money in my business. Uh, looking for the lifestyle on Waiheke Island because you know, where else would you go? <laughs> and um, and coming from the culture that I was embedded in within the food industry in Australia into the, the very different culture of Waiheke and New Zealand in general, uh, and having been introduced to James and and listening to the information that was presented by the uh, by the, the transition towns movement uh, and I guess piecing that logic together and pairing it with what I was um, I understood from my you know from how food systems work and recognizing wow we've we've got a real problem here you know um, we've been doing it this industrial way since forever as far as any of us can remember um, but it started to really add up that it uh, you know it's, it's running into walls it's overextending our, our food system is, is in a state of overextension and so in a nutshell the discovery was that these large industrialized centralized globalized corporatized whatever you want to call it you know all of those elements that create the existing dominant food system are um, <coughs> The efficiencies within them are fantastic when you measure, you know, how you can get food to seven billion people or six billion people. I forget about the other billion, but uh, but the um, the impact that it has on the environment is uh, extreme, in, in which which is what James has indicated to you with, uh, with those slides earlier. Uh, and in, but on society and on culture, it's it's decimating. It's, it's, it's destroying a lot of our cultural, social, local um, fabric that that is what keeps local communities alive and thriving. Um, our food system is such an important part of that, and you know, <coughs> always has been for a, for a long time. Even even with agriculture, with the agricultural model, 
has largely been our food systems what's underpinned a lot of our social fabric. Um, when I started to see the impact of that from a distance, you know, being shown the, the, the statistics, it really, uh, really opened my eyes. But then reflecting that back and looking at how our actual supply chains work within our own business, it really confirmed it. It was like, yeah, that's true. You know, yeah, about 20%, less than 20% of the retail value of the food that's being sold on the, on the supermarket shelves is actually getting back to the grower. And they're the ones who copied all the brunt. And the rest are, you know, lucky, clever guys who got in and put the ticket and figured out how to maneuver some things around and do a bit of arbitrage and, you know, make a lot of money. I mean, you can make a lot of money out of food because everyone eats three times a day. So it's really right for making money you know, if you know how to do it. Um, but at such a, at such a long-term detriment. So um, the idea that, that really kind of came up for me was this idea of, wow, there's so much intelligence and smarts around how we are moving our food long distances. And we're able to cut so many costs out of the equation by getting coming with these new techniques and storing and logistic management and so forth. What if we could take that, right, and that, that, that developed systems and so forth and apply that to a local food system where you've got the amazing advantage of short distance, where you don't have to double handle, triple handle food, um, where you don't have to store food for a long period and so forth. And the idea was, well, I, I reckon that you could cut out a lot of the fat out of the supply chain whilst, and, and, and deliver a really uh, affordable and convenient way of access to food, local food. Um, without putting, whilst allowing the growers in, on small scale local production farms to be able to be paid enough money for it to be viable for them. The big challenge right now is that you've got, you've got a lot of small growers here in New Zealand and around the world who are trying to compete with the large monoculture type of organisations. And they just don't have the capacity to be able to run on margins like 30% or 20% of retail. These, these small guys don't. And so as the large organisations have been taking more and more of the market share, sorry, the, the way the, the large organisations take more and more of the market share is they, because they're so big, they can run on smaller and smaller margins, which pushes the small growth out of the market. To give a very simple example, there's a, a, a lettuce grower on Waiheke Island. And he used to supply the Waiheke Woolworths with lettuce. And this is only about four years ago. Mm. And he got a letter from Woolworths saying, we're sorry, but you can't supply us lettuce anymore. Because you don't supply enough for it to be worth our while. The cost of keeping the accounts and making sure we pay you on time and auditing and all that sort of stuff, it's just not worth it. And so this guy, has gone from running a business with about 80 to 90 percent capacity, you know, good, good business. Now he's down at around 30 percent capacity. His son, who was going to take the business over, is going. Well, I don't know about you know having a farm business. It looks like hard work to me, and besides, I've got no way to get the product to the market. He's thinking, well, I might just sell it as a lifestyle block. Boom! There goes one more local grower. That is what really underpins a proper local economy. You know, food production is the basis of, of any economy, really. That's what we do everything for, isn't it? So we can live. So that, that's the kind of problem that we're going through. Right now, we've got lots of small farmers um, that, when they're looking at their future prospects, they really can't see anything, you know, other than selling off as a lifestyle block. But there's still a little bit of momentum. It's a sad story, and it seems like we're, we're, these farms are dwindling down. But we, we're not, we haven't, it's not dead yet, and there's still, still some momentum. And I, I believe that there's enough still going on. Just the last, the last hopes are still there that are meeting an increase in demand from the market. And the really exciting thing is that us as customers, as people who are eating food, are becoming aware. And we're realising that where we put our money and the food that we buy is making a difference to the future of the sort of food that we can eat.
you know, in the future for ourselves, for our children, and so on. So it's been um, it's been a really exciting journey. You know, when we started UV, that was five years ago. We started with the idea of just building a network of people who grew food themselves to connect with each other and dialogue and so forth online, and that's been that was great, and it still is great. Um, and after we developed, after getting around about two thousand members, I think it was mainly around New Zealand. What we realised, and about two years after we started, what we realised was that we need to now, now that we know who's growing food and who's interested in growing and, and interested in local food, we need to solve the problem of getting that food from from point of production to the to the place where it's being eaten. Um, so we developed uh, a few. We tried a few different models to to make that work, and but in the end of the day. The model that we've developed is, is basically a two-link supply chain. So if you imagine a typical supply chain is, is at least three links. So you've got the, 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 gro the grower, and then the grower sells it and transports it to the wholesaler. And then the wholesaler sells it, or holds onto it for a little while, first, then sells it and transports it to the retailer. And then the third link is you transport yourself to the retailer buy it and transport the food back home. So it's a three link system. The idea with Ubi was to cut a link out, because the link costs, that's part of the supply chain cost, right? So we get take from the grower and we bring it to an aggregation hub, which is, it has a, up until recently just been a shipping container with some eager people waiting to unpack and repack and, you know, and then, um, and then straight to your door. Okay, so there's no there's there's no intermediary uh, function within within that supply chain, which cuts about up to thirty percent of the cost out of the supply chain, which means that you can make a small distribution food distribution uh, you can make a food distribution model work on way fewer customers on a way smaller number of customers than you would need for a larger. Uh, more established type of traditional distribution model. Plus, it means that um, everyone within the supply chain is, can be paid fairly. So, when we started, we started with 50 customers. We're, we're now uh, over 400 customers. And um, we have been able to pay, so it was a test, you know, it was a bit of a prototype to begin with. We had, not had a hypothesis that should work, it ought to work. And we've done it now where we're able to pay our growers 50% of the retail value. So typically you're looking at 30% goes to the grower. If it's international, if you import it, it's 20% or less goes to the grower. With the Ubi model, or the local food model, it, it's 50% can go to the grower. So now, you know, our friends Mike, the lettuce grower's son, can look at his business again and go, well, actually, if I can get 50% of the retail value, this is actually a, a viable business again. Okay, so, and, and we've been able to do that now for three years. Okay, we've just, we are pretty much on the anniversary of our third year of trading. And which is, we only trade one day a week and we're all, we all work part-time. Uh, so it's a part-time organization, but we've just clocked over our first million dollars of sales. In fact, I think it's today. <laughs> So it's working. That's the point is that this is a problem that's huge. The whole food system problem is probably, possibly one of the biggest problems we've got. You know, when you when you look at the issues of climate change and energy issues and so forth, when you drill it down and say, well, what's the problem with that? Well, it means we can't eat, right? <laughs> because if climate change burns all of our all of our wheat fields and corn fields, and if you know floods and so forth wash away all of our, you know, whatever else food there is. It means that we can't eat. And ultimately, at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's air, water, and food, right? And our food system challenge is, it's, it's so enormous, it's hard to look at it and even conceive of a solution. But if you, can, if you can just say, just let's solve it only one little spot, one little place, and just, just show one area, one demonstration of how you can actually solve it, then there's an antidote that can replicate out. So here in Auckland, um, that's what we're working on. We're working on a prototype, we're working on a demonstration that shows that 
you can put you know, a little bit of money in with this kind of system, with supporting these, this group of small growers to start with, and you can make this thing viable. And then from there, as it scales, it becomes more and more viable. And all of a sudden, local cottage food, artisan foods and things like that start to compete. The prices of those products come down because the supply chain costs are getting thinned out. Okay? And all of a sudden, you're like, it costs me the same to buy Mary's homemade strawberry jam, and it's just as easy for me to have that on my doorstep than it does for me to buy you know, this big craft whatever, and it's, it's a no-brainer. You know, plus, I get to get that warm and fuzzy of knowing that Mary's getting a good share of the, of the dollar. And you know, I might even see Mary down the street and be able to tell her that, how much I love a jam. And so it brings, it, 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 it's, we, we can actually bring that connection back into our food. And that's what we're working on, is, is, is a system that, that allows that. that the exciting thing is, it's like, is that it's going to happen regardless. And it's, this is an, an inevitable thing that's coming out of technology. We haven't been able to do the movie trick before. None of us have, because we haven't had either the technology or the adoption of technology by the marketplace. So because, and the, the, let me kind of drill into that, that the, the reason that, that our model is working is because we've been able to build the software to do a lot of the administrative functions automatically. So there's, we, we've, we've cut out a lot of the, the thinking, the administering, the, and all that sort of stuff just to, to make it so that a few people on part-time hours can actually move a lot of food. Okay? That wouldn't be possible before people had adopted. You know, there was there was a prolific adoption of, of email and of, of web browsers, you know, shop online shopping and so forth. So it's kind of you know, it's like oh, this is really exciting. Aren't, you know, aren't you guys clever? It's like well, yeah, actually, that's no, just a sign of the times. The technology's coming in, the demand is coming in, the problems are building up, and I'm excited because I really feel like whilst it's a big ogre that's looking us in the face. It's kind. It, we we will solve them. We will solve them, and and we are solving it. And ultimately, it comes down to each one of us and the decision as to where we put our dollar, because it's that dollar that's going to support one system or another. Um, you know, we are only as an organisation, we are only one very small part of a much much larger solution that's that's coming up around the world. Now I'm involved, uh, we're involved with uh, an organisation in, in the United States called uh, Food Commons and they are developing models for exactly the same kind of problems that we're working on and now we're working together to be able to you know, strengthen each other's models. So we're bringing logistical and um, just distribution, sales, marketing, management, so processes to the table. They're bringing governance and ownership models and so forth to the table. And all of these solutions are starting to coalesce, and it's just very hopeful. And then I, I guess I get to see what's going on behind the scenes because I'm part of it, and I, part of my job is to let you know that things are really happening out there. Um, and you know, I'm, I feel like we're on the winning team in terms of whether things are going to change or not, because the change is happening and it's actually happening quite rapidly. Um, you know, just. We've also just launched into Sydney as well, so this solution is something that can be replicated out. And it's, we basically have developed, just like James was saying, with uh, the food forest manual, we've developed the startup manual and the operating manual and the software systems behind that for anyone within their own local area who's got, who's got the impetus and desire and a little bit of just a little bit of smarts to um, to get to get a local food system going. And the, the, the great exciting thing too is working with uh, James and the whole food forest movement is that ultimately that's really where we want to be going, all of us. Is that the more, if, if we've got, if, if from Ubi's point of view, we can support projects like local food forest for food production and we can be a channel to market for the food that comes from there, and then we're able to help that demand that, that, that pulls that, those, the food from those places. It's like the, the market needs to precede the, 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 the supply. Sorry, the demand needs to precede the supply. 
And so by starting out, by, by, by having an outlet where you can, you can start to buy food that is as local and natural and, and, and uh, small scale or small holder scale as possible, we start to create the demand that then makes people say, hey, I better get into this food growing business. You know, that people are making money out there and it's, 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 it's good. And so we can create that, that environment that encourages young people to think, what if I could get my hands on a 10 acre plot of land that that guy's not using over there? And what if I could apply some of this food forest technology to it? Let me do the songs on that. And, wow, if we did that, we'd be able to build a home you know, within this many years. And this is a viable option. Let's, why don't we get into business? Why don't we do this? And that's what we wanted to run encourage is, is innovation, entrepreneurship, and, uh, and the ability for people to, to see that there is a real viable um, living and uh, way of contributing by participating in the production of local food. Uh, I think that's, that's me rambling enough. If, if James, did you want to jump up here too and, and go into some kind of question time and see how you go with that? I love your um, the inspiration. Um, yeah, it's a vision and the, 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 um, the possibility that you hold. Yeah, it's, 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 yeah. Um, he was telling me the other day that um, he came across um, another company doing something similar and they changed their model to be more like Ubi's model and they've yeah. just done a big funding model. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Um, an organisation in, in the US called Good Eggs. Um, and amazing. I mean, the, the space is just so full of, of things going on. But yeah, these guys have, uh, they just raised about eight and a half million dollars, you know, to get out there and get this software out and about. This does raise one thing though I, 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 want to, I want to share, is what we're doing with Ubi also is we're working on a model that is all about being a collective ownership, collective governance model. If you think right back, you know, in the early days of mercantile pursuits, you had these guys, these, these um, market, what, what were they called, the merchants, right, with their, with their caravans, you know, and their, their donkeys, and off they go down the road, and then they get to an intersection, and they'll set up camp, and they'll sell their you know, whatever product and whatever product and so on. And usually in an intersection where markets will start to form. And each each person within that within that intersection around that intersection was a private held business and they would trade things back and forth. But the, the land underneath them was common land. The since then, you know, as as the markets have evolved, um, the land that facilitates the trading of food has largely become privatized. And the, the platform for, for, for trading of food is controlled by private interests. And the private interest's primary aim is to extract money. We all know that. So the idea with Ubi is to say, well, we're kind of on a new frontier. We're on the new online frontier. So you've got your on land, and now it's, it's a wild west, right, in the online space. What if we could create a new kind of commons, a new kind of ownership which is based on the idea that no one owns the land. Well, not sort of no one owns the land under our feet that we're doing our training on, but we all own that. Right? We all own that collectively. Each business within it that's a private, privately family held or whatever held business, it generates its own profits and so forth. But the platform, the marketplace itself, isn't owned and controlled by a private interest that they're going to be able to tweak it for, for extracting wealth. So that's what we're working on with Ubi is, is a commons model where, as a shareholder myself, um, I don't get to take any dividends. I get to participate by offering my you know, skills and expertise and so forth. I get to be paid for my time and my, my injection into it. But that it's, it is a, it's a commonly held platform. The, the technology itself is held by all of us. The, you know, the assets that, that facilitate the easy transaction of, of local food into local tables is a commonly held uh, entity. So if the commonly owned entity is dissolved, where does the profit go? If the commonly owned entity is, is dissolved, where does the profit go? <laughs> where, 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 you know, the assets are 
as it's a hot, dark, or soul. Well, I mean, to what extent is it commonly owned? Well, you I mean, know, it sounds ideal from the way you're speaking, but I'm sure it's not like that in actual fact. If it's sold, <laughs> if it's sorry, if it's yeah. dissolved, sorry. where do the assets go? Well, I was going to ask how, how, how would you dissolve something which is commonly owned? No, no, it's, not everything is commonly owned. No. What is commonly owned and what is not? Yeah. This is where this is where we're working with the guys in the food commons in, in the states. Mm -hmm. To it, it, it's all about the ownership and governance model. So it's effectively like a cooperative. Okay. So if, when a cooperative is sold, mm -hmm. where do the assets go? Well, I guess the deposits go back to each depositor, yeah, so. and any physical assets are divvied up between members. Yeah. So I mean the same the same principle and rules apply. It, although it's not it's not a it's not a cooperative per se, it is we're working on the model that replaces or works similar to a cooperative but without a lot of the constraints that current cooperatives have. So you as a shareholder, who are the other shareholders? Right now I am the other shareholder. Okay. So right now it's a limited privately it is a limited company of which I am the shareholder. Okay. And I'm holding that in preparation for it to be handed over into a trust, which is uh, which is held in the Commons. And I've made that very clear from all, right from the beginning. So it is, for me to, to, for me to change my mind and say, oh, well, actually, this is too good to give up. I mean, it would just be, it would, it would, it would be impossible for me to do that and be able to hold my head up. Is there a possibility that it, will, it, can, be, it can be transitioned as, I believe that things are going to fall apart much more than your company will survive. Yeah. Is there the opportunity for your co company or concept or whatever you call these things to, to morph or to transition? Totally, and we, we, we talked about that a lot at the beginning because we, you know, we recognised that we were building a platform and a network on the internet. Mm -hmm. That was, that was a, um, you know, a foundational aspect of, of building a movie. And, and, we kept, and we asked that question, other, well, what, what happens if the internet isn't there? You know, if we don't have access to it, <clears throat> and we clearly concluded that what we were actually doing was to was, was building the network of people who ultimately do go toe to toe, eye to eye with their neighbours, and get to know a lot more people in the process. And at that point, if that internet is not there, we've we've done our work of, of facilitating a lot of what's necessary. I've got a similar question, um, and it's, it, it, it relates to the cash that's in the system. I mean, at the moment, we're all just good consumers, whether we buy our food from Ubi or not. Um, so we contribute to the GDP and so on, which some people in this room probably find to be a uh, reprehensible idea. Um, what, what do you do to take the, to disconnect it system, or have you thought about disconnecting the system from the cash economy that operates? That's a great question. How do you do it? Yeah, we we have a system called rubies. Okay. Um, so alternative currency? currency? Currency, yeah. It's an internal mm -hmm. currency. We now we, we now refer to it as like loyalty points because there is there's definitely <laughs> issues. <laughs> it's that, that, yeah. Effectively, we you know we it's an internal it's, it's basically based on store credits. When we very first started out though, what we were doing in order to make it viable in the early stages while we were figuring it all out. Um, People who are packing or people who are driving for us were basically giving their time and being paid in rubies, and then they were using those rubies to be paid to buy food. Okay. Um, it, as as we scale, it becomes more, you know, we be sort of come under the radar a lot more, and we've got to be far more careful to make sure that we're not uh, falling foul of the law. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I am totally in support of alternative currencies, and I feel like there's, there's a, a lot of value in that. I mean, and we've been talking lately about how we could interface with things like Bitcoin or whatever. Yeah. Um, but again, it's, it's one of those things. This is this is one of, a, a long-term type of project that um, it can't be rushed. In. I think more than anything, this is something that that relies on a solid base of trust as well as that the systems build on top of each other over over time. Yeah. You know? So we can only do sort of one small thing at a time. Sure. Thank you. Thank you.
Well, that's how the worked back in the day. It was a bartering system. What you had, you gave to someone else who didn't have it. It wasn't really an exchange of money. It was an exchange of product. And, and that, that will happen very um, more frequently as more food is being produced locally. So as we get more um, local food production within the suburbs and within our central um, cosmopolitan areas, then there will be a more of that naturally happens because these people are growing and they're going to trade with their their neighbours. The excess, which you know they might harvest from their garden, their food forest, whatever, um, that obviously is it's it, that's an opportunity to put it into a, a system like Ruby, which is a distribution system, and get some dollars for it. But a lot of the rest of it is going to be quite outside of that the conventional um, currency system. Yeah. Yes. When you compare UV to a say, farmer's market, where do you see the differences or the benefits of UV versus a farmer's market? Yeah, I think that they're one of them. They, they, they complement each other greatly. Um, a farmer's market is a great opportunity to go along and connect with directly with the people that are growing the food. Uh, the main difference is that a farmer's market can only reach as many people who can get up out of bed on a Saturday morning and put up other things to get along to experience it. Uh, whereas with Ubi, it's an online thing that comes to you. You, know, it, you can interface with it when you want to interface with it, uh, and, it and the product comes to your door. So it's an extension of the farmer's market, uh, pretty much. Yeah. Yes? I've got a um, question coming about the scale of it. So it's probably to do with how how big a kind of area or a sort of population size do you think something like Ruby could, could reach? Or do you think that maybe if it sort of started to include a wider geographical area, it might kind of turn into maybe sort of two separate entities or three or more? And then the other question, which is sort of separate, is sort of um, what scale of, well, sort of what size of farmer or garden or kind of things are probably like how small scale could that, could that get? And that's like what it's designed. Yeah, great. Well, firstly, it's really designed as a city model, city by city. So we're doing it in Auckland, you know, and now we've just opened up in Sydney. So the scale of, of market size, we're, folk, we're, 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 we're prototyping it as, as a city. Um, and that's because there's enough people in that city to be able to support the starting up process of that, as well as we you know, the agricultural dog around the city um, to access it. Uh, your second question, um, yeah, we've been, we've been toying with, uh, at the moment, with Auckland and Waiheke Island, and at the moment the packing for Waiheke Island is being done on the, in Auckland, so all the food is being you know, sourced from around, mm -hmm. as local as possible, to, uh, to Auckland and then brought there, and then we, we pop the ones for Waiheke on a boat over to Waiheke and deliver them. But on the island, we all want to have, you know, when we think of local food, we mean, well, obviously it means on the island, right? So um, now we're looking to work with um, a local business on the island, existing local food business on the island, to facilitate that, uh, that function on the island. So this will be our first prototype of that, and then we'll, you know, we'll be able to learn from that and figure out what's a, whether the population is going to be viable or not. Uh, but it's very much, we're, we're really experimenting at the moment. You know, we've got the Auckland operation running for, for three years. We've got some good runs on the board. Now we're experimenting with Sydney and seeing how well it replicates out. Experimenting with Waiheke to see, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Can I just ask for someone who's just bought Waiheke Island and you house the island to the and there's enough land on it that I can see the potential for doing lots of things, but just for um, lack of knowledge, <laughs> where would you go to, to to kind of get some understanding of food forests and the the kind of systems that we could maybe start to look at? So sure. yeah, foodforest.co.nz is, is a good place to start. Okay. You know? yeah. And and what we what we um, agreed to do from the UI is to um, start to list the educators who are educating people in the space. So in fact. Um, the, the, the days directly after the Hui, um, Robina McCurdy, who's been doing a lot of work down in Golden Bay, um, 
she was up for the week. We had people from Dunedin to, to Perrier in the far north come to that event. And, and she held a, um, a one-day workshop on how to design and build your food forest, so small scale. Um, so there are people who um, all, are already doing it, and, and there'll be more of those offering workshops on how to do it. There's, um, there's also a project called Handover yes. Hundi, yeah. um, and that uh, you pay $100 and you get the resources and the materials to uh, basically grow your own vegetables, and they kind of give you the support along the way. And the idea is that you make that money back within six months or a year, I think it is, and they kind of help you along. Yes. And Bill Mollison's written a really good um, pamphlet on food forests. I mean, it's a little old now, because he was the person who started out the permaculture movement, which is what where food forest comes from. And it's available for free online, and it's really very good. Bill? Bill Mollison. He's a Tasmanian person, I believe. So. One of the best exports from Australia yet. <laughs> it, it's, it's pretty amazing what's happening. I mean, I, I've been um, getting more and more information constantly to post through the social media um, links, so Food Forest NZ on Facebook, for example. Um, I've been posting one, two, three items a day onto that for several months now because I've got um, constantly this automatic search going to, to bring me whatever is the latest news about food forests from all over the world, yeah? And it's just like every, almost every day, one, two, three new stories pop up um, and from all over the world. It's, it's blossoming. And, um, <clears throat> there's a great example in, in Seattle, which um, we'd love to replicate or even do better than um, here, and that's in, um, in Seattle, they've designed an eight-acre public food forest um, called Beacon, uh, Beacon Food Forest. And it's, uh, yeah, it's a great example. Of, so it's another one. Yes? There isn't on that area that you saw there. There's forest all around it, so it might look like that. But actually, if you take away all those, the, all the lines and all the colours, and you take that away, it's basically pasture. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you're like converting that area. Yeah. So we're converting pasture back into into a, a forest forest garden. Okay. But if you're working with nature, bush, and New Zealand, then can you just kind of plant some things in between? Like, would you, you have to take out? Potentially you could. I mean, there are some things like, you know, tamarillos um, work really well in bush, but it's not, it's, you know, that's not the ideal approach. If you, you know, you're more likely to take um, an area where the ecosystem, the forest has been already cut down um, and regenerate it, build it back up again. Can you visit that? Not yet. <laughs> But they are they are committed to they're committed to to um, <coughs> recording and documenting the whole process. Yeah, so they're they're committed committed to it being an educational. Um, mm. Not like seeing it for yourself. Yeah. It's a great concept. But Absolutely. If you're a visual kind of person. Absolutely. Yeah. There are so so what I didn't mention. So I went um, and did a, a couple of trips um, a few months ago. One down to Wellington and back and. And in that one, I saw a few different food forests. And one was a seven-acre, twenty-year-old food forest in Aukuni, of all places. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's pretty amazing, actually. Um, you know, Aukuni, when you when you drive through it, it's just it's that grassland. You know, that endless grass, sort of open, cut down, nothing on a tree to be seen. And then you go around a corner, and suddenly there is this forest, a twenty-year-old food forest. And then I went down to Riverton in the very deep south. There's a 15-year-old food forest down there that the Guytons, Robert and Robin, have been developing. Um, and at, at a 15 years old, um, they're getting a lot of produce out there. So there are some good examples around. And then, you know, if you have down in Riverton, go see that one. Isn't there one at the back of Unitech? There is, yes, there is the Unitech um, food forest. The sad, sad thing about that is that the governance um, structure that they set up for that 
it wasn't secure enough and, and it's looking like it might be under threat. Mm -hmm. um, and there isn't a, um, the, the, the maintenance of that one isn't um, as good as it could be. Gerard, do you have anything to say about that? Yeah, they don't have managed the succession at all. Yeah. Yeah. It was a question for you. Is how they manage succession in a food forest like that? When it gets all closed canopy and shades out everything. Um, then, then start getting things down. Mm -hmm. Opening it up again and take something out and you know walnut tree. I mean, what a great source of timber. Fantastic, you know. <coughs> now, look, of course, there's there's um, you have to take into account the evolution of a of a forest system um, and keep modifying it. But the modification effort is tiny compared to. The, the, the energy effort that it takes to grow a, a, a field of open corn year after year after year after year after year, after year you know, while the soil is going down, 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 down. So the problem with the unity one is it's basically being overgrown? No, it's not, not really. And it's not so much overgrown, but it, there's a lot of layers in there that aren't useful. Like there's a, there's a ground cover layer in there which is not an edible layer, and it's, so, and it's such a um, smothering weed. That um, it's very hard to get anything else into it. So, it's, um, you know, it, it, but the bones of it are there. You know, if somebody took it on, you could really do uh, fantastic things with it. So, so it's very important to get the government. Yeah, they leave it going. There's no one to manage it. You have a few chickens in there. That's a good thing. Get to the point where we can um, source all of our food and grocery type items through that kind of system so we don't need to go to the supermarket anymore? That's the goal. It is the goal that it becomes a comprehensive grocery service. But, you know, because otherwise, yeah, you, at the moment, all of our customers still have to go to the supermarket you know, to get the stuff they can't get through. But yeah, that is the goal. Um, and I think that you know, it's achievable in, in the sense that um, you know, one of the other points about the food that we choose and the criteria of you know, the food that's available through Ubi, it's not about saying, oh, we're going to draw a, a, a line, a 100 kilometre diameter, you know, radius around the city and not buy anything from outside that line. It's about saying, we're going to buy the food that is as local and as natural and as small holder scale as possible. And, and that's, a, that's a, depending on the product, you need to, some person just need to go further to get Coffee, for example, we all, it's not like we, we're saying, okay, well, stop drinking coffee because it's not local. And so, if you're going to be good, you've got to stop drinking coffee. <laughs> it's not that at all. It's about saying, let's find the, the coffee that, that best aligns with the, with the principles behind what we're talking about. And the principles are, you know, I, I, I totally, the principles do end up being about ethical principles. But really, it's not about right and wrong, it's about what's smart. You know, and and it just makes more sense, you know, in the long term. Um, so, you know, with our coffee, coffee for example, at the moment we're we're, we're selling the Kakako coffee, uh, but the blend that we push is the Papua New Guinea coffee blend because that's pretty close relative to all the other coffee, right? It's pretty local. Um, and you know, and then you've got all your other elements that you've got to work into your supply chain considerations, like well, what other fair trade? What's a fair trade scenario going on you know, with that sourcing? So a large part of our job is to curate the food, but also to provide all the backstory behind it, so that the customer can make a, a, you know, a, a, an aware decision as to what they're going to be putting in their shopping basket. 